Welcome to the Mentor Podcast, where the most highly motivated entrepreneurs come to get their weekly dose of financial stability with host Ron LeGrand, as well as other nationally recognized thought leaders who will teach you how to get, grow, and protect your wealth. Well, hello, everybody. Another issue of the Mentor Podcast coming up right now. And if you haven't joined that group, go ahead and do it right now, thementorpodcast.com, and then you'll get a reminder every Wednesday when these things are aired, and you can get access to our archives where I don't know how many how many of them we got. I've interviewed some very uh, good folks for you to uh, learn from, like the one we have here today. His name is Mark Moztek. We're not going to see his face. Uh, we're just going to hear him, but I think you're interested in what he's got to say because He's a good example of what you can do if you decide that you want to do it. And uh, he's a, become a multimillionaire on one commercial project, one commercial project that he did not fund. He used uh, other people's money to do this uh, project. So from there, Mark, I'm going to let, let you identify yourself. And then I'm going to ask you a few questions about our past. Okay. Sure. So I, started out as a student with Ron back in 2004. Um, I took the second commercial property boot camp, um, ugly, pretty house, um, but I was definitely attracted to commercial property. And it wasn't too far along. Um, I started helping uh, pre-screen properties for the commercial property boot camps. And then I became the Midwest project manager. Uh, Ron and I got a project in Bourbon, Illinois. It was a 125-acre mixed-use site. Uh, we bought it in September of 2006. Um, it was going to be a mix of retail, assisted living. Uh, we had uh, tentative offers from Jewel Osco, uh, AMC Movie Theater, uh, J.C. Penney's, and we started developing it. We bought it for eleven million nine hundred and twenty-seven thousand. We got a loan uh, that was going to for I think it was fifteen million, uh, which was enough for us to put in roads, uh, pumps, lift stations, and then, as you could probably guess, since it was two thousand and six, uh, two thousand and seven eight happened and the entire commercial development industry evaporated. Uh, yeah. So, and many, <laughs> many of my other projects, all of my other projects as well. All right, I, can, I, I couldn't remember those dates you just gave me. I couldn't remember what year you started. Uh, and you came to the boot camp a couple of times, but um, yes. yeah, that was the time we bought that first 125 acre project. I mean, it was right in the middle of civilization. And I remember that's the one where the seller wanted us to put a statue of his dad on the property. It's yes. One of the conditions that, that we pay, pay him. <laughs> and the way we funded that is that um, I, I, may, I signed on the loans, so I'm personally guaranteed loans. And then uh, I raised the rest with um, equity capital from private individuals. And we were coming along pretty good on that thing too, weren't we? We had the infrastructure, yes. the horizontal infrastructure going in and, and had big plans for it. And um, I don't even know what that project would have yielded us to date. I, it depresses me to sit down and even try to figure it out. But I, I know it was well over, I mean, multi, multi, multi millions I, of they, dollars. They appraised it completed at $171 million back then. Jeez. Was the projection. That, is that just the land? Is that just the land? Uh, yeah, that was what we would like our gross. We would have gotten from it. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, now I am depressed. I shouldn't have had you on here. It's feeling <laughs> pretty good to you got on here. So, um, <laughs> the uh, I forgot what I was going to say right now. So anyway, you we got that project, and that one went down after two thousand and eight, uh, as did many others, and you know anybody building anything. Tens of thousands of others. Anything. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then what happened when that project went down? Um, you went out and got yourself a job with a commercial uh, property so, finance guy, right? Yeah, there 
there was zero zero opportunities for anything to deal with um, commercial property development. You know, you had you had long term guys working for REITs that were getting fired and let go. Uh, in fact, the the guy uh, Peter the Benedictus who actually did our performa, he was uh, one like I think number two at one of the big REITs. Uh, he even got let go. He was there for like thirty years. Um, so on, while we were trying to raise more money on that project to do our horizontal development, we got in touch with, from another student introduced us to two investment bankers from New York who were in the process of raising our money uh, equity for us before you know the collapse happened. And since there were zero prospects, I kind of hit it off with one of them and we Basically, I asked him if he would take me under his wing and teach me investment banking, and he agreed. So I worked with him for 10 years. And then while I was working for him, one of the, uh, one of the guys I met through him uh, started approaching me on self-storage. And I was originally, I was like, nah, you can't make any money in self-storage. And, you know, and he kept nagging me, nagging me, and then I actually started digging into it. Um, probably about 2017, and I was like, "Wow, I'm like, you're you really you really make some good money on this stuff." So um, I started talking to and reaching out to people, you know, that own privately. Uh, reached out to REITs that managed and um, developers, contractors, um, you know, that specialized in building self storage. Try to educate myself. So I spent about two years doing that um i'm i'm big on proper previous planning prevents piss poor performance um so i i pretty much felt i had enough to start going to look at properties um you know we looked at about uh, i want to say four four different sites um uh, before i found uh the one up in springfield massachusetts uh, all right well hold on a minute and, let's go back first of all tell our listeners uh, what is a REIT? Oh, real estate investment trust. In other words, it's just a fund that invests yeah, in real estate. Yeah, it's a estate. big, big fund. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you, you so, like examples of those would be like life storage before they got bought up by extra space, public storage, Cube Smart, I store. You know, okay. they're all. So you worked for him for 10 years, and that must have brought you back into the loop around uh, 2018 or so. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Then you got out there and started looking for properties again. I want to go back a minute as well. Um, sure. Let's, see, let's, let's look at it from your point of view. Our project in Bourbon, Illinois, we paid $12 million for the land. How much of that did you put up? None. And how much debt did you incur in your own self? None. None. Okay. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, well, these are big numbers. I, I, you know, I can't do these numbers, <laughs> really. Well, you're talking to a guy right now that did it, and he didn't have the money either, and he didn't have the credit, and he got other people to put up the money because he made it worth their while, which leads me into this project you're going to talk about on self-storage. So you got interested in self storage, then you just started looking for buildings that would fit the parameters, and you found one. Where was it? Springfield, Massachusetts. Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. There, there was a few before there. that that we whacked because of problems and issues, but I, yeah, I, I just you know ground up. Um, there's always issues. You know, I can tell you stories with my addition I'm doing now. <laughs> uh, it, it's it, you never know what you're going to find when you dig in the ground. So I I wanted to start out with a conversion. Um, so I was looking for basically empty manufacturing or big box stores. Uh, typically, you want to get something that's already zoned industrial because a lot of times you could get pushback from cities if you're trying to rezone from commercial to industrial. Uh, most most parts, at least of the Midwest and East Coast, you need industrial zoning for self-storage. 
So, well, um, speaking of but, that, it took us two years to get that property in Bourbon A zoned, and we had to annex it into the city. Uh, and you know, that's a long time it went by. It's too bad we didn't. Too, too bad it didn't take less time, and we might even have oh, some we, buyers. No, no, we were we were we were really fast with that, Ron. I think six months. Yeah, well, it was fat, but uh, remember, we started wild. putting in the road. That was a lot of that was a lot of acres that we had to grade. That 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 land was all graded. We had the water and sewer and stormwater pipes in. We had detention ponds put in already. I mean, it was it was pretty far along. We we hustled on that. Absolutely. All right. So you found this project, and. You thought it would be perfect for self storage based on what you learned, and then yes. what? Um, so we put in uh, my the guy that talked me into self storage, and I um, we put down a thirty thousand dollar deposit, um, got it under contract, and proceeded to get our Alta survey phase one. Um, you know find a local attorney um to do to work on it um in the process you know we we reached out to some of those um owners of self storage to see if they wanted a partner one of the groups wanted us to do a third party independent market report so we ordered one of those um it was you know we we found uh we you know, we met with Cube Smart Extra Space and uh, Life Storage. We totally fell in love with Life Storage. They were just absolute top tier. Uh, unfortunately, you know, they got sold or absorbed by Extra Space now. But um, so they recommended a bunch of contractors. I flew up, met with the contractors, and um, decided on the one that we decided to use. So doing our due diligence. I had them come out to the building. I also had two of the area managers from Life Storage come out to the, walk through the building all together because, uh, you know, they see a lot of properties that are good, bad. So it was just reinforcing to make sure I was making a good decision. Uh, they loved the location. Uh, my GC, who did a phenomenal job, uh, he, he, you know, he said this, you know, pretty straightforward. This building's got good bones. Um, so it was uh, 46,304 square feet with 25 feet uh, to the rafters. So what we wound up doing was pouring a slab inside the building, doubling the inside square foot, square feet. And the park, I mean, it was, it was an ugly building. It was like pink and yellow on the outside with brown doors, green on the inside. Uh, we, we just gutted the whole thing, all new wires, sprinklers, electric, um, parking lot was destroyed. It was just, you know, it was, uh, the original building was built in 74 and then there was an addition in 82 and 87, if I remember. So it was like two additions. So, uh, we redid the parking lot, painted the whole building up. So we wound up, I don't know how much, so if Ron wants me to tell the whole story. So we, we got into this. My partner was supposed to raise the equity. Uh, we had a guy that was supposed to raise the debt. And I was the guy that was basically doing everything else um, as far as development. Yeah, just like, just so, like you were on my project, actually. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So we were do the work. Uh, about a month. Tomorrow. Yeah. We were about a month into it. My partner said I got 750000 raised already. We were working our private placement memorandum. Um, and I was like, oh, things are going great. This is good. And then about three weeks later, I'm like, where are we at with the equity? Because the PPMs are going out. And then I get told, oh, nobody wants to do it. I'm like, how do we go from 750 to nobody wants to do it? You know, like I don't have enough stress doing all this other stuff. So, uh, you know, we, we knew we were in a bad spot. So I, we reached out to the seller and we said, listen, 
we need a little more time to get this together. You know, we'll have it if we let our earnest money go hard early and we push it out 30 days. So they agreed to that. Um, then we found a bunch of people. It's amazing all these people. I'll, I'll give you this as a good laughing sign. Anytime somebody tells you they're going to vacation in Europe and then they they love the deal and as soon as they get back, they're, they're on board, they evaporate into thin air and you never hear from them or they change their mind because we had a whole Correct. bunch of high net worth guys. Correct. It was, it was yeah. absolutely nauseating. Uh, so that, that we, had, we had two guys that did that to us. So we're, we are now at the middle of August and we had to close at the end of September. And we, <laughs> like I said, it was, it was like, okay, we got this, this is great. And then crickets. So stress was very high. Um, so what we wound up doing is, oh, well, you know, I told my partner, I said, well, you were the one that's supposed to do this. You're going to, you know, we're, we'll eat crow and tell the guy we need another 30 days and they want another 30,000 down. So he, he coughed up 30. Um, together at this point, we had about 100,000 into it between the two of us with due diligence, lawyers, everything else. Uh, now that includes having the PPM worked on. That was like sixteen thousand. Um, you know, we had corporations set up, and um, we were. It was it was getting very tight. And um, we finally found the guy that I partnered with, um, and I I flew up to meet him middle or end of October. Uh, we had a great meeting. He loved everything. He's, you know, high, very high net worth guy. He's like, I love it. He's like, I'll, I'll pay cash for the building and you know, we'll, we'll, I'll get the, I'll get the loan. So originally we were looking uh, for like a 70% loan. And then because we couldn't raise the equity, we found a, um, a, a life insurance company that was willing to do private debt. So they were willing to fund 90%, which helped because instead of needing 2.4 million, we only needed like 800 and something called 900,000 bucks. So that reduced the amount of equity we needed considerably. Um, the issue with that is for them putting up 90%, you couldn't get any developer fees, which we obviously needed to live on while we're developing this. And they also wanted 35% of all cash flow. So think about that. That's all when you sell it, they get 35% and 35% of all your monthly income. So it, it was a lot That's to give up. But at that point, pay for a loan, isn't it? Yeah. it is. But when, when you know, you're, you fail at raising equity, um, you know, yep. you, you have to, you, don't, you hate to lose the project. It's like, what, what do you do? And that was pretty much what we were facing at that point. Um, so when my current partner came in, he's like, I'm not doing that loan. That's crazy. He's like, I'll just go get my own loan. Um, so, you know, he paid cash, a million six cash for the building. Uh, he funded the, we're, we're still trying to find a loan. Um, and he got a phenomenal loan. We got zero over LIBOR. So we were basically paying 2.64% on our construction loan. Nice. Yeah. Um, so he, he funded out of pocket until we got the construction loan just to keep the project moving. And then uh, he got reimbursed, obviously, at closing. Um, All right, minus, so let me stop there. It was there, 80. Man. Yep. He was the guy that put up the money or borrowed the money in a case he did both. And. Yep. At that point, he was at risk because he did have to personally guarantee that loan for a couple of years. And I don't want to get into well, all of that. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah so he I'm, didn't care I'm if he had like to personally folks, guarantee it. Yeah. I'm thinking like the folks that are watching me here right now. Uh, you found the person that had what you didn't have to make this project work. You had plenty yes. of reasons to back out of this thing all along the way. You kept pushing. You learned a ton yes. while you were uh, trying to fund this project. Uh, you know, one of the 
important things you learned was the whole world's full of crap. You can't believe what anybody tells you until it hap actually happens. I understand that one. And, and of course, you learned a lot about the building process along the way as well. Uh, but the key point is, if you, you came in with a good plan, you came in with a good spreadsheet, and of course, that's one of the most important things you're going to have to attract people to it. So you got the deal. You showed why it was a good deal. And uh, in my experience in life, it ain't hard to find money for good deals. The deal is the hardest part. The money's not. So to bring this to a conclusion, you spent, what, two years working, building that building? Yeah, that was a year year for construction, and then we uh, had one. It was actually at one one year after our certificate of occupancy, we got approached by a broker and said he's got guys that want to buy the building. We were at uh, so we did at my old job. I used to do due diligence when I worked for an investment banking firm. Uh, you know, I underwrite, I create performance for properties, check other people's performance do lending packages, debt and equity packages. Um, so, you know, with this project, I already had my own model. And, like, you know, the, the big, big selling point on this is, and I, I emphasize this for everybody, if you're going to do one of these projects, you have to know everything about the project. Because when you start getting asked questions, because it was not only my partner asking questions, you know, he had his lenders talk, his, like, what did he know about the project, Right. You, you have to you have to know these projects inside and out. They don't want to hear, oh, I don't know that. I mean, if you don't know, obviously oh. say you don't know, but like I was always at, always able to answer any question they had because I, just, I lived and breathed this thing for over a year, right? It drove Tish crazy. Yeah. But it worked. Yeah, I, I, was, mean, I was uh, grouchy I and was stressed out. <laughs> Tish was complaining about how grouchy you were during that period. Uh, yes. Tish, by the way, has made my long-term executive assistant who happens to be the fiance of Mark here. Uh, and in fact, you met her you know, while we were doing that Bourbon A project, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. But she, was in, she was in charge of handling all my projects at 21 of them at one time uh, with folks like you on the ground making the thing work. Now, so you, you um, didn't expect to sell it that soon, but when you build something no. that's that nice, I wish we could show them pictures, but we can't. And it's income producing, which is the key point. It's income producing. It's not going to be hard to sell as long as the numbers make sense. My mistake was I was developing stuff to sell, not to rent, which is the biggest lesson I've ever learned in my life. I'd never do that again. Uh, if I was developing stuff to put people in that would produce cash flow, I might, might have the, the, all of those projects today. So you um, um, had about, what did you tell me, six million bucks in this thing when it was all said and done? Yep, six, 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 six okay. and a half, call it seven. And when you sold it, the buyer contacted you, you didn't even have it on the market, did you? No, they did, they did, they had a client list so it was never publicly advertised. It just went out to their select group of purchasers. Yeah. Uh, who's they? Did you hire a realtor? To uh, Colliers. It? Colliers. Colliers. Okay. All right. Well, so you did have it on the market. All right. And uh, what did it sell for? 19 and a half. Okay. Well, I'll let our listeners do the math on that, Mark. Okay. You don't need more than about one of those a month and you'd be okay the rest of your life. Uh, so would you agree that that one project that you struggled through but came out on the other end, it was a life-changing project for you? Absolutely, without a doubt. Yeah. Don't need but one of those, ladies and gentlemen, and you're set for life. Not only are you set for life, your children are set for life, and probably your grandchildren are set for life. And Mark's young. <laughs> he ain't done yet. So you out there looking for some more project right now, Mark? Yes, absolutely. And that, in fact, that's why we have the commercial uh, mastermind group going, CMG, we call it. Yes. It's a group, there's a group of people who have attended my commercial property boot camp, which is coming up soon, by the way. And because frankly, we can't work with you <laughs> until you attend the boot camp and we can speak the same language. All right. Uh, and that's, Number one, and then number two, if you want to join the group, you can. It's a very expensive group. It's a mastermind group. We meet three times a year. 
and uh, it's full of people that actually want to do deals, and sometimes they want to partner with me or with Mark or with us. In fact, I've done, I don't even remember, quite a few student deals in the last couple of years. And as I recall right now, Mark, one of those is under contract to sell or yeah. two of them. And we one of them is, yeah. yeah, we sold uh, Ypsilanti uh, and the one yeah, by the prison. That's Michigan. Yeah, Mich yeah, both of those are in Michigan. Yeah. And uh, three pieces of land, two of which we had right here in Jacksonville with another student partner. So, um, you know, we're the real deal. Now, I've got to warn you, though, Mark now um, is, is in this group and responsible for uh, pre-screening your projects before we decide. I mean, you don't have to work with us, but even if, if you go forward and you're in that group, you're going to want to work with us because it don't cost you anything extra. And his job is to kill deals. So that's why we call, what do we call you, Mark? The Reaper. <laughs> The Grim Reaper, yeah, and it's a name well earned, I might add, because he kills most of the projects that come in. And but along the way, isn't it just as important you to figure out what's going to kill a project? It is what's going to make it go forward, and so we have to put a lot of them in the in the pile to get one to go out the bottom that makes sense. Mark, what would your best guess be that the number of commercial um, offers that get accepted accepted the percentage of those that actually close? Mm, yes. Maybe one in 30. No, no, no. I'm talking about the ones you get under contract first. Maybe one oh, in 30. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I thought you meant the ones we screen versus the ones we move yeah. forward on. Um, yeah. Oh, pretty, pretty high ratio. I, I would say if, if it passes this pre screening, um, unless there's some reason we can't come to terms, uh, I, we usually get them tied up. Right, but due I said, diligence is the key contract yeah during the due diligence my guess would be about half of the deals fall out before they go to closing it's got to be at least half because due diligence kills yeah. a lot of deals for sure it's, and that's what you're so good at is doing due diligence from your computer and stopping going forward and wasting money on projects that uh, are not what they seem to be or the numbers don't yeah, make sense absolutely fact, and sometimes and, and uh, what I was going to say, Ron, is that's one of the benefits of being in CMG because, like, look look at my project. So if we didn't close on that, we had a hundred thousand dollars. But let's let's say we didn't even put up that much money. If you take sixty, that was forty thousand dollars in reports that we spent. And what I try to do now is help everybody do that due diligence for basically nothing. So we have enough to we, yeah. when we know we're going to go in because, yeah, you you could say, well, I'm only going to put down a refundable whatever ten thousand dollar deposit, but you still you need attorneys to look over the contract. You got to get an Ulta survey. You got to get a phase one. You got to get wetland study. Like all this stuff is money. So what we're trying to do is do our due diligence to make sure we're not going to get sucked into losing money. And I could tell you we we have some great examples from even people in CMG that I tried to say, Ooh, you better be careful with that. And they proceeded forward, be, you know, because it, listen, it's, it's a mental game. Everybody wants to be right. Nobody wants to hear yeah. that what they think is going to work. And, but we're here to save you. And, you know, we, yeah. we one of our CMG members oh, yeah. says he's going to do one of Ron's things and don't do what I did. <laughs> um, you know, in fact, here's a here's actually a good one too. We had a former CMG member um, who reached out to me. They invested twenty five thousand dollars with this guy who claimed they could convert a school, rezone the school, convert it to self storage in six months. And I was like, "You got to be kidding! You didn't fall for that. There's, that's impossible." <laughs> and she's like, "Oh yeah, the whole group of yeah. us did. You know." They, they took, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars from us. And it, so I said, so I'm like, if you had been in CMG for the 15,000 bucks, you would have saved your 25 in an instant. At least. I mean, we're, we're yeah, there, least, if yeah. not more, right? Yeah, if not more. So, you know, your expertise is make, is pre-screening the property. That's all what it amounts to. And uh, yes. uh, again, though, CMG is... 
not something we need to discuss unless you've been through the commercial property boot camp. And by the way, if you have and you want to learn about CMG, uh, email tish at lagrandprojects.com, T I S H at lagrandprojects.com, and tell him you want to just put it in there. I want to learn more about CMG. We'll get to you. Uh, Mark, uh, what would you say was the biggest thing you've learned along the way in that uh, two two year period for this one project? Um, probably write a book on I, it. You, 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 you have to, like I said, you you have to know all aspects. If you're ever going to sell a project, you you have to you have to have the answers and the right answers. Right. Uh, I, you know, I, I can't under, if you're going to ever pitch this to anybody, you, you have to be able to walk them through the entire thing. You have to like, this is how I got these numbers. This is like, it, you know, even if you're not creating the performer, you need to know the performer well enough where they say, okay, when were you going to hit this, that coverage ratio? And we're going to say it's commercial boot camp and stuff, but you, you have to be able to walk them through the project, why it makes sense. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you a story. When we went to sell this thing, the group that bought my building, they wanted to talk to me before they even would consider putting in an offer. These guys grilled me for like an hour on why I picked that market. Well, wait, there's all these other self stores there. I was like, but they're all mom and pop shops. Like there's, there was only, and I explained it to them. I said, I went through there. I said, they're all mom and pops. They're little stores. The only REITs in the market at that time were Life Storage and CubeSmart. I said, and I walked them through the whole process of how I thought I was going to get this. And then at the end of the conversation, I'm thinking to myself, why are they grilling me like this? Because like, do you want to buy my building or not? And at the end of the conversation, the head guy's like, would you be interested in developing self storage for us? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, can I be interested? So, I mean, that's, that's what I mean. It, it, you, you know, do yourself the service of educating yourself because like mm -hmm. Ron always said, you only need one of these deals to go successfully and people want to come to you. Oh yeah. They'll but that's you. why it's so important. They'll you have, you. don't be lazy. You know, you'll get people who will get a deal and it's like, Oh, I'll just let somebody else do it. Good. But the buck stops with you. Right. When you take yeah. somebody else's money, you have to treat it like it's your grandmother's money, your mother's money, your money. Like it is precious. Do not waste it. Do not squander it. And like, that's why my partner, like he loved me. He's like, you're the best partner I ever had, Mark. He's like, I do deal with you any day. Um, that's because you that's, created some somewhat conservative numbers. And they oh, yeah, I was very conservative. conservative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so like when, words, when I did that, my loan, that, yeah. yeah, I so I projected selling it for fourteen and a half million after seven years, um, you know, and and when I did the loan, like because I know what the banks like to see on on their you know, on their loans, so like even though we had a two point six four percent, I I did five and a half percent on my loan. Now, interestingly, and it looks like right at the, at the end the rates shot up. So we went from $11,000 in interest a month to 30,000 on the month we sold it. But so we hit five and a half percent after our two years, right? But I figured five and a half. So we had all this extra interest reserve that we didn't need. And banks like that comfort. They don't like when you, cause they'll, they always, banks will always look when you're trying to smudge numbers. With mine, I had it hit like I was 50% over for operating costs, a, like cushion. I had way over what I needed for interest reserve, and it gives the bank comfort. It was an easy yeah. loan for them. All right, so um, well, guys, if you're watching right now and you want to learn more about commercial property, not these big projects like he, we start with smaller projects, uh, and you want to work with Mark and I, uh, uh, then uh, starts with it, comes spend three days at the boot camp with us, where we actually do deals that students bring in, incidentally, and call brokers and pre screen the heck out of them and talk about the exit strategies and all of that, where you get the money. In fact, on the first day, I show 14 ways to buy property without using any of your money. Go to thementorpodcast.com forward slash CP, Charlie Paul, CP. 
uh, which stands for commercial property. Okay. The mentor podcast.com forward slash CP. And on there, on there, uh, you're going to find six commercial property lessons uh, that you could get immediately if I'm going there. And don't forget to sign up for the mentor podcast so you don't miss any of them. What was you going to say, Mark? What, what I was going to make one other comment too. So because I started out as a student, and this is very important for everybody. When I start out as a student, you know, I, because I always had like, is there anything I could do to help and everything? So that's how I got into pre-screening the commercial deal. Like back then we did about 3000 commercial deals a month screening because the classes were so huge. And yeah. I would, I would go because I, you know, Ron would take me to the other commercial boot camps to pre-screen deals, and I'd run into people I met at my very first boot camps, and I'd be like, "So, what have you done?" You know, like, and they're like, "Oh, you know, I'm, I'm still, you know, thinking about it and stuff." Think so, about it. you know, <laughs> right? You, you have to take action. You know, God is not going to drop a million dollars on your lap. You know, spend the effort and the time because it's worth it. Educate your the education is on these things is the most important thing you could have because it's going to yeah. save you tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in losses by just taking the time to educate. And it's cheap education. Just it's like if you lost fifty grand on a deal or even twenty five, you know, this is peanuts compared to what you could potentially lose on something. And that risk yeah. of loss is way higher than the chance of you making money without educating yourself. Right. So you're saying that education is worthless without implementation. Is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> That's what I always say. That's uh, where we come in. We're going to help you implement if you want. Uh, by the way, you can go to ronlegrand.com and I'm sure you can find the information on the commercial boot camp as well. Uh, coming up and we hold it right here in Jacksonville, Florida. And I'm sitting in the meeting room right now where we'll be uh, teaching on it. All right, Mark, well, we're a little bit over time, so uh, we could probably spend two or three more hours on here. Um, if you're game, <laughs> I'm not. So, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for your participation here today. Yes, sir. I think you've been quite educational to our listen uh, to our listeners. And I hope for the so. rest of you, we'll see you on the next The Mentor Podcast. Remember, thementorpodcast.com forward slash C Charlie Paul CP and gets those free lessons that are recorded on commercial property. You kind of get a better feel for what we, what we do. All of our projects ain't a, all of our projects aren't building anything. I can tell you right now. Um, I like land and of all sizes, three or four of those deals in the last year. And I like income producing properties and I like other kind of properties in the middle. If I see some uh, turnarounds. So, well, you know, Ron, you just to give interested. them, I was going to say, just give them some, our two properties that we had partnerships with students here in Florida, um, we, we bought the first property uh, for 221000 we held it. This is 301 and we had a net profit of 256569000 um, the other property on that. Normandy, uh, we sold that yeah. for 650. We bought it for 205 on a tax deed sale, and that one we made 257, 620. That, that's you know those are good. That's 100 percent profit in just a few years. So I mean the the money is absolutely out. there. I think we were in our third year before they sold, if I'm not mistaken. But to be honest, uh, that property you just discussed had wetland issues. In fact, we had 13, 14 acres, 10 of it was wet, can't build on it. We didn't know that when I bought it because we didn't have time to do the due diligence, which I'll never do that again. That's a good point. Don't, don't ever let anybody pressure you to buy something when you don't have time to do the due diligence on it, okay? But of course, if I wouldn't have bought it, if I'd have known that 10 of it was worthless wetland you can't do anything with. Uh, the other property was actually a nice one, sitting out there on 301. Um, and uh, by the way, I paid $150,000 for that 13 acres, zone commercial, and I borrowed 100% uh, of the 150, just for the record. Okay. Uh, none of my money went into that property. All right. Well, Mark, we got to get off of this thing. Yes, sir. Thank you for participating today. Appreciate it. No problem at all, Ron.
That's all for this edition of the Mentor Podcast. To connect with Ron and learn how you can attain financial freedom, as well as up-to-date strategies to grow and protect your wealth based on today's discussion, go to www.connectwiththementor.com.